and welcome to Zambia Today. I'm your host, Faith Katai. On this episode, we will be discussing the role of civil society organizations in good governance. With me in the studio, I am joined by Caroline Katotowe, the Executive Director Center for Sustainable Democracy Governance. Madam, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. We are delighted to have you in this studio. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. So um, tell us about your organization, Center for Sustainable Democracy and Governance. Yes. What is this organization all about? Well, thank you for the opportunity to obviously talk about what I'm the most passionate about, which is my organization. Um, Center for Sustainable Democracy and Governance is primarily an organization that operates as a think tank. We are a group of professionals, experts in various fields, including research, and mainly our focus is to ensure that democracy, the tenets and principles of democracy, are being upheld in the country. But also we go a step further to ensure that if they are being upheld, should we, are we able to sustain rather, are we able to sustain this democracy over, you know, a period of 10 years? Should we relax? And the answer to that is no, we are not to relax just because we are enjoying, you know, uh, the fruits of democracy. Because democracy is something that is uh, quite elusive depending on how you harness it, uh, if you do harness it. So uh, our organization primarily is into ensuring that democracy is sustained for the longest of times. And also also, we look into issues of good governance and leadership itself. We are very passionate about uh, transformative leadership because it is from that that we see development happening. Great. So why was uh, this organization formed and uh, when? So um, it's a newly formed organization, newly founded uh, in 2024, this year. And um, it was formed primarily because of a need and a gap that we saw within our political dispensation. So here's the thing. We have currently um, an environment which is the most democratic, if ever, in the history of our Zambian politics. But this is a good thing, you know. You know, when you look at it uh, from a layman's point of view, it is a good thing. But under under this umbrella of democratic expansion comes a lot of um, elements and challenges. Um, what am I talking about? Here I'm speaking to the fact that sometimes societies misunderstand what democracy is all about. We know democracy is upholding human rights. We know democracy is having the voice of the people come out strongly. We know democracy exists in participation in election, peaceful and fair. But what we most don't know, or most society doesn't know, is that democracy doesn't mean abuse of the rights, of your rights, of your freedoms. Democracy doesn't mean anarchy. And we have seen that with the coming of um, democracy in its full application now, uh, since 2021, and with the expansion of the democratic space, we have noticed that there are individuals, some in the political space, who do not fully grasp what democracy is all about. And there are also citizens who think democracy means I can say and do whatever I want. Of course you can do and say whatever you want, but within the confines of the law. Democracy also means the rule of law. And it's because of that gap and misinformation and misapplication of democracy as we are enjoying it now, that we saw the need to um, form this organization that specifically looks into how we can manage our democracy. Awesome. So then what is the significance of civil society organizations in promoting good governance? That, that's a brilliant question, and especially that you're asking it to us, myself, who's heading a, an institution that looks into governance. Uh, civil society's role is very important. It's, uh, it cannot be overstated in the sense that it is civil society that mainly looks into the checks and balances when it comes to governance. Uh, civil society organizations, the beauty about um, CSOs is that we are not um, vying for political office. Our interest is primarily, uh, you know, with the, the Zambian people, with the citizens. And so when we come as civil society into this space, into this political space, we are coming with very clear lenses in terms of how we view the dynamics of our politics. And it is because of that that our input 
is you know devoid of all the subjectivity that comes with other political players for example you know when you're talking about opposition political parties you find that there's a dilution in terms of their checks and balances because sometimes it is coming from a very subjective point of view it's coming from politicking but with civil society we look at it in terms of um, is this beneficial to the Zambian people. It does not matter which political party is governing at the time. What we want to see is that that governance is good, number one, and that governance is uh, primarily uh, directly linked to the development of our country and obviously uplifting the, the, the lives of, of the people. So civil society plays a very key role because we are in the middle. We are the balance in terms of the government and the rest of society, but also we are a go-between in terms of the Zambian people and the, the government. So because of that, it is very important that civil society does their work well. Because uh, if we neglect to do our work well, the people of Zambia suffer. Because at the end of the day, we are representing the people of Zambia. Just as government and politicians, those that are elected, are representing the people of Zambia, we are also representing the people of Zambia. So in uh, fostering transparency and accountability, yeah. how do civil societies contribute to that? Uh, well, especially when it comes to in government institutions. Okay, so um, with government institutions, uh, civil society, um, especially now, I'll talk about our scenario now because um, before now, civil society's role or civil society's input when it comes to institutions and all of that, government institutions, was very minimal. Not that civil society did not come to the table. Civil society was always knocking at the door to come in and have uh, an opportunity to bring their expertise, to bring their skills, to bring their, their input. Um, but now with the coming in of the new Dawn government, we've seen how there's inclusion when it comes to civil society. And this happens at the very highest level in terms of decision making and also in terms of uh, interaction with policymakers, but also we are seeing it in terms of uh, oversight institutions. And civil society is at every table where decisions are being made, including policy decisions. And when we say at the table, we are not only um, people that are looking on, you know, we are, not, uh, we are not there for the sake of being there. We are not, it's not a ceremonial, it is not um, uh, something that we are doing just to, to, to show our numbers. But it is where we are being asked in terms of what do you think? What are some of the, the, the knowledge that you're coming with? We are bringing something to the table. And so we have looked at, um, this inclusion in terms of strengthening institutions, because that is number one, for good governance to happen and for government institutions to function at their optimum, there must be institutional strengthening. And so institutional strengthening is also in the form of human capital. It's also in capacity building. And so civil society has been very big when it comes to helping you know, the government and government institutions to capacity build and also to bring in the necessary skills and expertise and know-how when it comes to very, very challenging issues. And we applaud the government for this and uh, we applaud the government institutions for this because there is no um, no person that can claim monopoly of a knowledge you know of knowledge all of us need to put our heads together and we are coming with different um, uh, uh, ideas with different skills and this is what has been happening so currently civil society has been very very instrumental when it comes to institutional support when it comes to institutional uh, strengthening and in the form of human capital bringing the skills and expertise on the table great so caroline i would like you to cite some of the examples uh, of successful initiatives led by cso's uh, that have positively influenced good governance mm. Well, there, there, there are quite a number, and I won't go into all of them, but this is information that is already in the public space, public domain. Uh, some of the good initiatives, I think we, it goes as far back as uh, uh, during the, the bid for a third term by the then president, uh, FTJ Chiluba. And we saw how civil society, with all the other you know, uh, members of society, came together in terms of trying to, you know, um, 
put a stop to that, to put a stop to that ambition, and rightfully so, because it was going against our, our constitution. And this is just one example. Other examples, for example, well, is, is the Bill 10, you know? The, you know, when we had the Bill 10 and we had civil society come out very strongly and relentlessly so, tirelessly so, to, to speak against it. And we all know what happened when it came to that. And these are some of the efforts and activities that have ensured that good governance is practiced and because when you see civil society coming out strongly like that, normally it is because they have the backing of the masses. And that is my point initially. Civil society is, has a mandate from the Zambian people. And part of that mandate is to ensure that the people that are governing this country are governing it well. And these are some of the, the examples that I can point to where civil society really came out strongly. There are a number of them. We can also talk about laws, you know, where we have civil society come out very strongly for, you know, decades, if we are talking about the enactment of the access to information law. This is something that started in the early 2000s by civil society uh, uh, institutions and leaders. And uh, we saw it, you know, uh, come, into, come into effect um, when it was enacted last year in December. And so these are some examples where you see civil society really steering the ship in the right direction when it comes to the governance of this country. And that is how pivotal and that's how important the role of civil society really is. Awesome. So um, in terms of advocating for human rights and safeguarding democratic processes, mm -hmm. do you think the civil society organizations in Zambia are taking up that role? Well, yes, yes, they, they are. They are taking up that role. and. Um, um, what we see now is obviously when we talk about the civil society taking up that role, we're talking about civil society attacking that issue from a position or a place where it matters most. Because when you talk about human rights and advocating for human rights, we must make sure that certain infringements that border on certain laws are addressed. So there's a lot of uh, call for legislative reforms, which is a good place to start. So instead of just simply putting up placards and standing in the streets and advocating, which is absolutely a good thing, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think there's a better way to address these issues. And you address them at a higher level in terms of our legislation. What is our legislation speaking to when it comes to upholding human rights, for example, and uh, the freedoms that, that citizens should enjoy? Because if we look at that in that, in that, in that way, we we are actually saying we are addressing the problem from the root cause and not looking at it from branch level. So branch level would be civil society taking to, to the street. You know, we've seen such kind of advocacy before. And you don't see much of that anymore because my understanding of that as somebody that has been in the civil space is that that should be the last resort for any given situation. When you see people having to take to, to placards and so on, it means you have a government that is not listening. And that is the only, you know, avenue or channel in which, uh, you know, civil society and citizens can express themselves. But in this case, where you have a government that listens, you know, a government that is inclusive, a government that is consultative, we as civil society are now sitting at the table with government leaders and with lawmakers, policymakers, and we are saying, this law is a cake. You know, we need to get rid of it. It should have been gone long time ago. And the reasons are X, Y, Z. Can we start the process of, um, you know, uh, uh, removing this law? Uh, and, and these are some of the things that have been happening in the background. And of course, we've seen them play out. We know the Public Order Act um, is something that is under review. And obviously, at some point, uh, we will see the fruit of, of, of this uh, 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 law. And we've seen, obviously, also when it comes to other laws that in the past, for example, the defamation of the president law, which uh, kind of bought on the infringement of people's rights, or not kind of, but really bordered on the infringement of people's rights, because it was a gray area in terms of, you know, somebody says one thing and then the next thing they're being, you know, um, uh, uh, prosecuted for it. And we saw how this law, you know, was repealed, and, and, and rightfully so. And we like the cooperation that we are getting from, of course, 
the head of state has set a very good precedence and tone, and we see everyone else at every other level of governance following suit, including our members of parliament in the legislature, because it's 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 a it's separation of powers. But these are three arms of government that needs to work, you know, in unison in in order to achieve the 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 mandate that the people, you know, have given them, and also in order to achieve progress from a civil society point of view, we need these three arms of government working together with civil society. And we've seen this happening. And so that is why we are thinking um, it has been a good time to watch, you know, to watch how this has played out in terms of the impact, in terms of the reforms, in terms of the advocacy. So the, the quality of advocacy has changed. We are no longer have the kind of advocacy that yields very little results. Our advocacy now as civil society has been very deliberate. It has been very uh, focused and it has been very rich in quality in terms of our input. It is no longer about pointing out issues. It is about also bringing something to the table in terms of solutions. So primarily, that's where we're sitting as civil society. Quite informative. Let's uh, now take a short break. Stay tuned. Zambia Today is a program that keeps you informed on various government policies and programs. Join us every Tuesday at 18 hours on the NIS TV, Topster Platform, Channel 6 DTT, and 458 DTH. Don't miss. Welcome back. In case you have just joined us, you are watching Zambia Today. We are featuring Caroline Katotowe, the Executive Director, Center for Sustainable Democracy and Governance, who is explaining to us on the role of civil society organizations in good governance. Ms. Katotowe, back to our interview. I'd like you to explain how do civil society organizations uh, engage with citizens to ensure their active participation in decision-making processes. Right, thank you so much uh, for that good question. So civil society, specifically our organization, we engage with citizens by doing what we're doing right now, by me sitting here and uh, explaining, expounding on issues that concern citizens. Um, we feel also as civil society and CSDG, to be specific, that there's a lot of misinformation out there when it comes to uh, various issues of national interest. And uh, we know Zambian people are very alert, they're very awake, and they're very knowledgeable and quite critical when it comes to issues. But there are certain times when certain information that is propelled out there by different, you know, um, uh, actors within our society is not correct. And it is for us as civil society to first and foremost give the correct narrative. And when we talk about correct narrative, we're talking about factual and not uh, politics. We know, of course, other stakeholders, for example, political parties and, and, and leaders and their people, um, there's a lot of politicking when it comes to the narrative that they push um, uh, forward to, to, for citizens to consume. And so we are that um, organization, for example, CSDG, that comes in with the truth as it should be as facts as it should be, because it is from that position that citizens are able to make informed decisions about any issues. And so, coming to your question, our interaction with citizens is through, of course, media. We are very grateful for what you're doing as the media. We can't do our work without you, so that one we really appreciate and applaud you for it. And also, not everyone has a chance to be in tune with the media to listen to us. So we are more deliberate in terms of how we disseminate information and we engage with citizens by ensuring that we find every avenue possible where citizens are to be, you know, in, in, in different uh, uh, circles. We, we look at churches as well. We also look at traditional leaders and also community leaders because this is where you find citizens participating in various activities. And we try to align ourselves with those institutions and their programs to give out information, cardinal information, key information. It is not an easy task because we're talking about 10 provinces and we are talking about, uh, you know, um, 
uh, a country of 20 million people. And out of that 20 million people, most of those are residing in very remote rural areas. So civil society um, has the good intentions, CSDG has the good intentions, but we need also uh, the resources and funds to be able to execute our duties well. So these are some of the avenues in which we actually um, uh, have contact with, with uh, the Zambian people. Another avenue is we target you know, the, the legislators themselves, the members of parliament, because these are obviously the ones that are directly in touch at all times or should be at all times in touch with the Zambian people. And what we do is we make sure they also understand some of these issues um, so that with that grasp and deeper understanding of uh, pertinent issues that border on national governance and you know uh, national interest they are able to explain better to their to their constituency uh, 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 members you know members of, of their constituency in terms of what is um, obtaining on the ground so we are at all levels of dissemination which is the grassroots um, institutional but also we are looking at um, empowering you know uh, community leaders and advocates uh, which includes traditional leaders as well as uh, the clergy wonderful let's talk about the challenges yes i know you as csos you are doing quite a lot yes. like you have explained yes so what are some of your the challenges that uh, you face in your efforts to promote good governance and how do you overcome some of these challenges great that that, that is a brilliant fantastic excellent question and i know most civil society leaders when asked about that the first thing they run to is resources i know yes there's the issue of resources you know funding i think it is a given and you know it's not a, a, a it's a no-brainer really that civil society are non-profit so we are not doing this to make a profit we do what we do um, as a matter of um, patriotism as a matter of um, you know uh, giving to our nation to our communities and yes that is a challenge resources and i will get into it in just a bit but the biggest challenge that i have noticed in terms of us having an impact as civil society is bordering on the way civil society organizations have been perceived over the last 10 years. Um, one thing that you will notice is that there are certain narratives that have been flying around when it comes to civil society. Civil society, first and foremost, are not um, political parties. There's a big difference there between civil society and political uh, parties. But the problem is sometimes civil society is made to look partisan. Civil society is non-partisan. Civil society is almost like civil servants because we work with any government that is in power that has been democratically elected by the Zambian people, constitutionally elected by the Zambian people. And the reason is simple. The reason we are non-partisan is because the people of Zambia chooses the government that they want to be leading them. And who are we not to work with that government? And so normally the challenge comes in whenever we align ourselves with whichever government, you know, uh, whichever political party is in government at the time. Um, colleagues in the opposition or, you know, opposition political parties see this somehow as a deviation from our mandate as civil society and they propel a certain narrative. We have had um, uh, individuals in, in opposition political parties um, you know, talk about civil society leaders as being compromised, talk about civil society leaders as being partisan, uh, all because you, they, they see civil society leaders working with the government of the day. That is our mandate. That is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to work with the government of the day. Whichever political party forms the government of the day, we are to work with this because we have one thing in common. And that commonality borders on making sure that the people of Zambia receive the good governance, the development that they rightfully deserve. So that is the biggest challenge. And unfortunately, this narrative created by politicians uh, for their own obvious reasons has been filtered into society and now you see citizens also looking at civil society uh, with that kind of lens through those lenses where they feel civil society is not to be trusted but when we talk about civil society civil society is simply doing what civil society is supposed to do so that is one challenge and we are trying to change that narrative because we are saying look 
we are not, you know, in this to, 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 to win votes. We are actually in this to ensure that the leaders that you elect as Zambians are doing what they need to do. We don't play politics. And if what we say in, in public space through the media yourselves sits well with the government or sits well with opposition political leaders, that is fine. That is okay. We don't, we don't have, you know, we have no qualms about that. But if it doesn't sit well, again, we have no qualms about that. Because uh, the only people that we report to are the Zambian people. Of course, we have seen civil society that has operated in very unprofessional manner as well. I think that one we cannot bury our heads in the sand and say, oh, civil society has been operating well. There's some civil society organizations that, um, you know, have not conducted themselves properly in terms of representing the views of the people, where they have put self over the people that they are to represent. And those, of course, should be called out. And those, of course, um, you know, it's, it's general knowledge. It's common, you know, common knowledge. Everyone can see that what they are saying is more subjective than it is objective. So those are some of the challenges that we face, creating a narrative that is correct about civil society and also having a balance within this political dispensation because we work with everyone. We work with opposition political parties, we work with the, the government, we work with uh, international organizations, we work with the Zambian people, we basically work with all stakeholders. So to strike that balance, you know, and not wait too much on one side or to be pulled into, you know, um, politics, for example, uh, is something that civil society has found to be a bit challenging. The other one, obviously, is the obvious, which is resources. I think civil society, for the longest, um, has been uh, uh, in need of resources in terms of funding. And I, I, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm coming from also a business background. And my, 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 my take on this is that civil society needs to move away from moving around with a begging bowl. And I think civil society needs to be uh, self-sustaining. That does not mean that you're making a profit. You're simply saying we need to be self-sufficient. We need to have our own resource base. And for the longest, civil society has had the mentality of funding. We need to receive funding. We need donor funding. We need to be funded. How about we change that, we flip that, and say civil society needs to have more sustaining ideas. They need to have strategies that will enable them to be self-sustaining. Get into, into investment, for example. Invest in, in, in agriculture. Invest in, in, in a lot of other trades that can um, uh, you know, bring resources to the institution. And so, yes, uh, funding has been an issue. And I know there was a time when civil society in Zambia inclusive, used to receive a lot of funding uh, because of the times at, 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 that were prevailing uh, during, during, during uh, those, those days. But things have changed, priorities have changed. Um, the international community is looking elsewhere. We've had wars, we've had drought. So the resource basket is almost depleted. There's so many competing uh, needs that civil society and funding civil society is at the end, at the bottom of that uh, list when it comes to um, uh, needs distribution. And so it is only proper that civil society no longer look to be funded, but also be more proactive and see how best they can pull resources to themselves by making more investment decisions than only consumption decisions. Awesome. So how then should civil society organizations collaborate with government and other stakeholders and in terms of strengthening governance systems and institutions. I know you have yep. mentioned yes. civil society organizations should yes. work with the government of the day. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's a brilliant question again. And um, timely as well, because uh, from what I've already explained, the rules of engagement have shifted. You know, and when we talk about rules of engagement, we are saying, look, you can no longer come to the table as a spectator. You need to bring something to the table. And civil society now needs to engage with government from a position of adding value. It is no longer enough 
it was never enough. But then it was acceptable during that time. But now we are saying it is no longer enough for civil society to point out issues. Civil society needs to apply their minds. Civil society needs to give solutions. Just about everyone can point out issues, but very few can give solutions. So if we are to be relevant as civil society, we need to engage with government at that level of interaction, at that high level of interaction and high caliber and high uh, 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 beneficial or high benefits uh, uh, kind of interaction. We can no longer engage with government uh, at a level of mediocrity, at a level of um, uh, lacking substance. And I think that is something that we have seen in the past, where civil society would advance certain causes without proper research, without looking into issues. And if we are to be taken seriously as civil society by the government, any government of the day, especially this one, which has the track record of doing things in a systematic way, in a categorical way, we need to up the game as civil society. We need to come with information that is sitting from a firm, on, on a firm foundation when it comes to um, being, being, being valid, being credible, being viable. So that is how we see civil society coming to the, to the table. We are there as CSDG to empower other civil society organizations when it comes to how best they can advance their arguments and how best they can um, have their arguments grounded in facts, researched facts. And this is because we also do research, as I mentioned, we're a think tank, so we are here to think <laughs> and, and we are here to research. And given that, we are empowering you know, um, other civil society organizations to be able to have a greater impact when it comes to their input and when they interact uh, with uh, government at whatever level of interaction. Great. As we come to the end of the program, Caroline, yes. um, how do you envision the future of the CSOs, uh, especially in advancing good governance? What should be the area of focus? Hmm. That is a profound question. Um, the future for civil society is, is bright. Um, we have a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, intelligent people. We have a lot of uh, brains entering the civil society space. Um, and also, it's, it's, it's a two-way street. Civil society cannot be in this by themselves. And the fact that we are seeing the government, you know, um, partner with civil society, we see civil society thriving even the more in, in years to come. And um, in terms of, uh, of, 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 of governance, in terms of ensuring that governance is, is uh, bordering on, on, on the good and not the bad uh, kind of, uh, of leadership or governance, we as civil society um, need to be more proactive. And when we say proactive, we feel um, we need to ensure that we bring everyone along you know, with us. We shouldn't um, have the people that we represent over here and ourselves up there. We need to carry everyone along in terms of everyone understanding what primarily governance is about. I think it's important that everyone gets to appreciate. And when we say everyone, we're talking about the Zambian people. The Zambian people, uh, policy makers, and all stakeholders need to appreciate um, what governance is about, true governance. And when we talk about uh, true governance or governance in its, you know, uh, in its pure form, we're talking about the kind of leadership that's transformative, the kind of leadership that is um, selfless, because that is what governance is about. Governance is how leaders, you know, make decisions, how leaders um, preside over, you know, uh, public resources. Um, and we expect a lot of prudence in these areas. And so we'd like the Zambian people, obviously, to uh, be able to appreciate this. And uh, it is only from there that at some point, each and every citizen will be able to see uh, the signs of bad governance versus good governance, which over the years has been seen as a gray area. It is not how loud a leader is able to, to, to shout during campaigns or how intimidating they sound. It is not the one who's able to dance the most. Good governance is sober leadership. It is that leader that is able to think 
and to stay calm amidst challenges. And we need all Zambians to be able to appreciate this and see this. And that will also set a tone in terms of how our people choose leaders to govern this nation. So for us, the mandate is that, you know, um, our task is, 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 is not easy. But we intend, uh, obviously, as we go along, to carry everyone along as we get to appreciate um, issues of governance and also our democracy as we sustain good governance and as we sustain democracy. Wonderful. Caroline, thank you for making an appearance thank you so on much for Zambia having me. today. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Most welcome. Thank you. Viewers, that's all we had for you on Zambia today. On behalf of the entire Zanis production team, my name is Faith Katai. Have a pleasant viewing.